It's no secret that the Jupiter Mining Corporation doesn't exactly deal with subtlety in their ship designs. Often built over multiple generations and large enough to consume whole cities, most JMC vessels were never built to land, never encounter wind resistance or gravity, and were instead built to transport the largest volume of mass from the outer system mining colonies to Earth and back again. Whether we're talking about the two mile long grey lump that is the Arthur C. Clarke, or the five mile bear moth of steel we know as the Red Dwarf. If you plan on going anywhere while you're on board, you're going to need to take a shuttle. And what better choice is there than the Class 2 ship to surface transport vessel, Starbuck. Built in service of the Jupiter Mining Corporation, the ship to surface transport vessel, known as Starbug, was deployed in fleets and attached to the larger mining freighters in service throughout the solar system and beyond. Built in three main sections, Starbug was comprised of the cockpit in the front section, crew transportation in the mid section, complete with seating area and personal storage lockers, with the rear section dedicated to cargo transport and maintenance sections for the ship's engines which mostly comprised of two thrusters with capacity to reheat and create bursts of thrust for extra speed. Direct collision course. Suggest evasive action. Engaging reheat. Designed primarily as a cargo and personnel transport, Starbug would be deployed for short trips back and forth from its mothership to the target planet. Whether said planet happened to be a human colony with a crew of astros on shore leave, or a load of machine parts going down to the latest mining facility, wherever that may be. Starbugs are also often loaded for scouting expeditions to identify new areas for mining, evidenced by the presence of ore sample pods that can be launched from Starbug back to its mothership. It was this demand for versatility that saw Starbug not only feature vertical takeoff and landing jets, but retractable tracks to allow Starbug to navigate areas with no obvious escape point for spacecraft. Click and a half due south. Suggest we continue the journey by land, sir. I'll lower the caterpillar tracks. Most likely mining tunnels and caverns, though these tracks would also allow the ship to navigate areas of dense foliage. Furthermore, Starbug was designed to be able to withstand prolonged periods of time underwater, just in case. Now, the ability to withstand underwater pressure was no doubt thanks to Starbuck's unique insectoid design, with each spherical section benefiting from no single weak or strong point, making Starbug an unusually tough little ship. Case in point, Starbug transports have been known to be able to withstand direct impacts from anything from giant flaming asteroids to high-speed collisions on a range of worlds. Damage. Not too bad. A couple of the sensors are out, the fuel intake chambers are both flooded, and the left pilot seat doesn't go up and down anymore. <laughs> we came through that intact? Starbug was built to last, sir. This old baby's crashed more times than a ZX-81. <laughs> That's what it's made of. Back in the 22nd century, aerospace engineers discovered that after a plane crash, the only thing that always survives intact is a cute little doll. So they made Starbug out of the same stuff. Is that a fact? Cat, you're so gullible. <laughs> Thanks! Due to the increased durability range and mission parameters with a Class 2 shuttle like Starbug, the barrier to entry to pilot such a craft was harder than, say, the Blue Midget series of shuttles. Learning to fly a Starbug required a practical and theoretical exam with far more focus on the hazards of the wider galaxy, mainly due to the need to fly further out from the mothership than you would on any other shuttle. Right, what's that one? Uh, heavy traffic keeps your assigned space lane. That one? Uh, danger, space mirages ahead. <laughs> stopping distances, you're traveling half the speed of light. What is the stopping distance? Uh, four years, three months. <laughs> and the thinking time? A fortnight. <laughs> space phenomena, what's that? A pulsar. And that one? A binary star. What's that one? A time hole. Don't help him. It's a time hole. No, it isn't. It's nothing like a time hole. 
It's a time hole. It is! It's a time hole! <laughs> a time hole is a phenomenon rarely seen in space, which legend would have us believe transports us into another part of space and time. Whereas that is quite obviously a blue giant about to go supernova. That is a time hole. <laughs> right, what's this? Under the JMC banner, Starbuck is a tough little workhorse of a shuttle. But let's imagine a scenario where the JMC is a thing of the past. A scenario where wearing a space crawl uniform is about as welcome as a tub of Slimfast in your local Greg's. In said scenario, let's say that perhaps a handful of survivors have lost track of Red Dwarf and find themselves floating in the void with just a few spheres of green steel between survival and death. If you're looking for something with a bit more, well, I don't know, glamour. But now is what counts, Trimmer. Living for today. I mean, who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Who knows what's going to happen in the next five minutes? That's what makes life so exciting. While Starbug is designed to do what it needs to do, there are some inefficiencies that are up for exploitation for the right-minded individual and maybe a couple dozen decades of free time. The midsection, for example, has plenty of spare room and with a little engineering know-how is capable of housing a galley as well as a second story with enough space for an observation room come science deck come sleeping quarters. These modifications turn a fairly basic crate with thrusters into a living, breathing space vessel capable of affording some basic comforts for the ship's crew, such as it is. Unfortunately, if you were to look beyond the surface, it wouldn't take long before you start to see the unfortunate issues with cramming crew space where perhaps it might not belong. One more time and you get this. Do you hear? Don't think I don't mean it. One more time. Just one more. <laughs> what did I tell you? I told you. Didn't I tell you? How many times have I told you? Now, without the nurturing embrace of a mothership to report back to, survival for the crew of Starbug becomes the number one priority. In a future where humanity has been relegated to the long forgotten shadows of history, one method of survival is salvage, otherwise known as plain old fashioned looting. But we don't loot space core derelicts, we just hack our way in and swipe what we need. We'll discuss this much more as we go through the video, but it's worth noting that without any spare parts or repair bays at hand, salvage for not only spare parts, but for materials capable of sustaining the ship becomes a vital part of the crew's routine. Beyond keeping the lights on, however, it's possible crew will stumble on new and unusual systems that they wouldn't otherwise lay their hands on. One seemingly basic, but not insignificant piece of salvage tech is the deep sleep chamber. Working along similar lines to the older stasis tech for interstellar craft, these deep sleep chambers reduce the aging process to an absolute crawl, allowing the crew to survive many hundreds of years of flight time without harm, bar some unfortunate cosmetic issues. Still, with a little ingenuity and a lot of imagination, Starbug is versatile enough to modify to meet the crew's every need. Hell, even the waste disposal system has the potential to serve as a torpedo launcher if you really squint your eyes. You tell me what he's doing is customise the waste disposal unit, fill the eject system with rocket fuel and turn it into a kind of high impact garbage cannon. You're going to try and shoot that out of the sky with tin cans and banana peel? There's a little surprise in the middle, a thermos of nitroglycerine. Waste disposal unit armed and ready, sir. Crichton, will this work? Lie mode. <laughs> of course it'll work, sir. No worries. <laughs> Hook, line, sinker, rod, and copy of Angling Time, sir. <laughs> Here he comes! Ready, Crichton? Fire! Yes! While operating within working distance of its mothership, Starbug is capable of housing a remote projection of its main computer system. In the Red Dwarf's case, Holly. From within Starbug, Holly is capable of operating the sensor systems, navigation charts, and engage with the crew on a personal level. Holly, what's the damage? Doesn't look good. <laughs> We've lost the port engine, the starboard engine's packed up, the fuel line's severed, we're taking in water through the hull, we lost the landing jets, half the electric's out, and the elastic snapped on the furry dice. What does that mean in real terms? Well, it means you've got a more tasteful cockpit. 
as well as operate the communication systems and hail other crafts in the vicinity. Beyond that, Holly is capable of taking the controls of Starbug and operating the sort of de facto autopilot. Though I wouldn't call her that too often. Engage autopilot. Autopilot engaged, well. I say autopilot, it's not really autopilot, is it? It's me, it's Muggins here who has to do it. Though the onboard computer systems can stream Holly's system, it's worth noting that her physical presence, by which I mean the servers and memory cores, remain on Red Dwarf and are far too vast and complicated to be housed in Starbug, or any similar shuttlecraft. But this means, should Starbug move too far from Red Dwarf, Holly will no longer be able to communicate with the ship or its crew. This causes a couple of notable issues. Not only does it imply that the shuttle is way too far away from its home base, but various technical and scientific systems fall out of use. In this instance, its important crew take on these roles to continue to monitor subspace anomalies, view navigation charts, and be on hand to communicate with other traffic while in space. Open communication channel system. Broadcast on all known frequencies and in all known languages, including Welsh. <laughs> this is Acting Senior Officer Arnold J. Rimmer of the Jupiter Mining Corporation transport vehicle Star Bug. Now hear this, because it's only coming once. <laughs> we surrender totally and without condition. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, additional. Sorry to take up your valuable time. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Bye. Bye. Sorry. Thank you. Bye. It's no wonder then, that after Starbug lost touch with Holly, the crew were forced to install two more stations in the cockpit just to keep on top of everything. It's important to note that this limitation does not appear to affect hologrammatic crew. Though onboard holograms are indeed generated by the hologrammatic projection suite on board Red Dwarf, the personality profile and appearance of the dead crew member are stored safely on board the internal light beam. A hovering lump of circuits that stay within the hologram's projected form, and can continue to operate within Space Corps affiliated ships and space stations. Holograms do still cause a significant drain on the ship's power supplies, however, which is a much bigger issue when you're too far from any friendly port where you can refuel or recharge. I'm just being a realist. Look, you only have seven minutes left to live. That's tragic. God, it's tragic. <laughs> but for the rest of us, life must go on. If I may interject, sir, in your case, that's not exactly true. Uh, remember, you are operating on emergency battery supplies. Uh, we have no spares. Uh, in fact, you yourself, sir, will expire in a little under four minutes. <laughs> okay, homeboys, let's posse. <laughs> It shouldn't really come as any real surprise that for what Starbug was designed for, food and drink wasn't exactly top of the must-pack list. How much food is there? It's half a bag of soggy, smoky bacon crisps, <laughs> a tin of mustard powder, three water biscuits, a brown lemon, two bottles of vinegar, and a tube of Bongella gum ointment. <laughs> gum ointment. I found it in the first aid box. It's that minty flavour. It's quite nice. <laughs> it's quite nice if you smear it on your mouth, old Sarima. You can't sit down and eat it. You may have to. And that's it. There's nothing else. Just a pot noodle. <laughs> oh, and I found a tin of dog food in the tool cupboard. Well, it's obvious what gets eaten last then, isn't it? I can't stand pot noodles. <laughs> No, it was up to the crew to bring what they needed with them, or load up the ship with enough supplies for the mission ahead if it was expected to take a while. Of course, if you're stranded from your mothership, this probably isn't what you want to hear. How are we fuel-wise? Unchanged for today, sir. However, the supply situation grows increasingly bleak. We've recycled the water so often it's beginning to taste like Dutch lager. <laughs> We're okay for food, though, aren't we? Uh, confidentially, sir, no. We've no meat, no pulse, and hardly any grain. We're still the only licorice all sorts left of those only little black twisty ones that everybody hates. <laughs> if that weren't bad enough, space weevils have eaten the last of the corn supply. So what's under the grill? Space weevil. <laughs> <laughs> you can't serve space weevil, Crichton. I mean, not even Lister with his single remaining taste bud will knowingly sit down and eat insectoid vermin. 
Well, let's face it, with him, it's practically cannibalism. Keeping the crew of Starbug fed and watered might be the most significant challenge on board. There are no replicators, no mile-long decks of water and canned goods, just a modest galley and whatever space you can find to keep the supplies in. Without any of the luxuries of the Red Dwarf, even the smallest treat becomes something to write home about. What the hell is all this down the back of my chair? Peanuts? No, I've been trimming my verrucas. <laughs> you have personal habits that make a monkey blush. You really think I'm psychotically disgusting, don't you? The peanuts, okay? Real peanuts? Yeah. Where'd you get them? Dad left a couple of months back. Found them in the dead captain's old donkey jacket. <laughs> Look at me like that. You enjoyed that mint imperial, didn't you? And where'd you get that? He was sucking that when he got shot. <laughs> What's more, the small amount of supplies you are able to rustle up aren't even safe. A little damage here, a little flood there, you're going to be hitting some serious trouble. So you mean, now we've got no papadoms at all? No papadoms, no carries. All the Indian food supplies have been totaled. I'll have to survive without them then. I'll have salads. Sir, you're in shock. You don't know what you're saying. After all, it's only curry. If you're looking for a decent meal, you're gonna have to be inventive in order to survive. Look, ever since that refrigeration unit packed in, we've had to live off a few pathetic handfuls of moss and fungi scraped off passing asteroids. I can't stand it anymore. Sir, are you really saying you'd rather have a psychopathic mechanical killer rip off your skull and play your frontal lobes like a xylophone than, than have another bowl of my nourishing space nettle soup? <laughs> Buddy, I'd hand him the sticks and hold up the sheet music. <laughs> Lister, they are simulants. Why on IO should they have food supplies? Because the ident computer says they do. Look. Stock to the gills. It's true, sir. Rogue simulants always carry large stocks of food supplies in order to prolong the torment of their torture victims. In some cases, they've kept subjects alive for over 40 years in a state of perpetual agony. If we wanted to live in a state of perpetual agony, we'd let Lister play his guitar. <laughs> we don't. I say drive on. Crichton, what's for dinner? Uh, tonight, sir, asteroidal lichen stew followed by dandelion sorbet. We're going in. Some solutions will be more dangerous than others, but should the crew be lucky enough to get their hands on some sort of wibbly wobbly time wand thing, well, the only limit to your greed is your imagination. Yes! Still, with a bit of discipline and an occasion worth celebrating, even Starbug can play host to a decent dinner from time to time. Is there any ketchup? Any what? <laughs> ketchup. I just thought you could do with a bit of ketchup. Just a dollop. Ketchup? Oh my god. You want ketchup? Um, brown, not tomato, brown. It's not like I've got no class. With lobster? You want brown ketchup? It's really nice, Christ, but you know me. I just thought I could do with a bit of a pep up. I can't believe it. I simply cannot. Be <laughs> oh, well done, bud. Now we'll have to do the washing up. Unless you get lucky and remember to bring along a television or film projector, there's not a lot to do on board a transport shuttle. It shouldn't come as any major surprise that Starbuck was never designed for long-haul flights, nor was it ever designed with a need to entertain its crew and passengers, beyond the JMC's standard in-flight magazines anyway, which handily act as a sedative for anyone who finds themselves under the weather during or after a flight. Hey, I read the in-flight magazine. Salt, an epicure's delight. The salt on my teeth. Oh my god! Did it hurt? No, I'm talking about the article. Have you done my leg yet? Without any real distractions, life in such a confined space is gonna test even the most tolerant of people. Even if you're not the type to snap at the first sign of irritation, such resentment will gradually build and build until the only thing left to do is explode. That is, unless you nip this resentment in the bud and clear the air, the best way you can. By saying that it can't have escaped anyone's attention that things have been getting rather strained round here of late. It's no secret that morale is on the floor. We've lost all trace of Red Dwarf, tempers are strained, and supplies are low. So, I've decided, if it's alright with you, to appoint myself morale officer. 
and set myself the task of raising the spirits and improving the atmosphere all round. Now, to kick off, I thought it would be productive if we all met once a week to have a coffee or a beer, whatever's your poison, <laughs> and get any problems we may have off our chests. Any objections? No, sounds like a very good idea, sir. Excellent. Well, as it's week one, why don't I start? You know what it is about Lister that really makes me want to puke? <laughs> that really makes me want to stab him in both eyes with an ice pick? <laughs> Everything, that's what. <laughs> Especially his god-awful, chirpy, gerbil-faced optimism. <laughs> and as for the cat, what an unbelievable git. <laughs> and Crichton, if he doesn't change pronto, I swear I'll attach jump leads to his nipple nuts and fry him like a Cajun catfish. <laughs> well, I think that's cleared the air. One solution to the endless misery of survival in outer space is to impose order and a sense of duty amongst the crew. Wait a minute. I'm in charge of security and surveillance aboard this vessel. I, Mr. Crichton, am the one who says launch scouter. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't mean to steal your thunder. Launch scouter. Launch Scouter. <laughs> or failing that, total denial of the horrors of reality in the form of video games. Specifically, artificial reality video games. Now back when the Red Dwarf remained in Earth's solar system, total immersion video games were the hottest product on the market. By directing the signals of the game directly into the user's brain, it was far too easy for users to become addicted to the machines, with some games actively encouraging this by making the user not want to leave in the first place. Now it took some time, but eventually a new, less sophisticated model of artificial reality was released. Made up of a headset, gloves and a uh, groinal attachment, the more physical setup allows the user to escape the game whenever they like. You can get out at any time. There's a button on the inside of your glove. When you want to get out, just clap. Now, crews salvaging the wreckage of space crawl derelicts in deep space might be lucky enough to get their hands on one and open the doors to such wonderful delights as the Detective Noir classic gumshoe or the down and dirty gunfighting brawler Streets of Laredo. Dry white wine and Perrier, please. <laughs> And what about you two chaps? Though, naturally, AR can also be used for some more primal reasons. You took your time. Where have you been? I was in the AR machine. Again? What do you mean, again? Everybody knows you only use the AR machine to have sex. <laughs> that is not true. Yes, true, it's pathetic watching you grind away. When you're... <laughs> Day after day, you're like a dog that's missing his master's leg. That groinal attachment's supposed to have a lifetime's guarantee. You've worn it out nearly three weeks. Get really lucky, and crew may find themselves salvaging even more advanced versions of the AR suite, giving them access to more advanced games, such as Austin World, World War II, and Camelot, catering to all audiences, and not just those wanting to spend an evening with a cheap pixelated date. On the more social side, Poker Nights are also a valid option on Starbucks. And if you're not in the mood for Name That Smell, why not camp out outside the washing machine and keep an eye out for those delicates? Wow, well, this is the best load yet. <laughs> Just for the record, I'd like to repeat that I'm only here because I can't sleep. So they decided to do some of me laundry and help out Crichton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not here because I'm a sad and lonely person who's entertained by women's underwear spin drying. My God, a G-string, where? <laughs> Navigating deep space many millions of years in the future is, generally speaking, a pretty bad idea. We've covered off a pretty wide variety of threats in the last video, from the sinister simulants to the downright terrifying polymorph. It's a sim! <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Oh my god, I'm so jumpy. I thought it was a stick. <laughs> it is a stick! But before we get too deep into the remaining threats out there in the distant shadows of the void, we need to take a minute to acknowledge that for all its charm and rugged good looks, Starbug is little more than a lump of green steel with a pair of rockets on the back. The Starship Enterprise, it is not. 
Whatever it is, they clearly have a technology way in advance of our own. So the Albanian State Washing Machine Company. <laughs> Step up to red alert. Uh, sir, are you absolutely sure? It does mean changing the bulb. <laughs> There's always some excuse, isn't there? The likelihood of something breaking down, deteriorating over time, or just generally falling apart is quite likely. By the looks of their manifest, they're loaded with tech. Maybe we can finally fix Starbug's thruster. I'm sick of always having to turn left. <laughs> Alrighty, bringing her in. Even if Starbuck didn't have a habit of hitting every flaming meteor or comet drifting through the universe. When things are looking particularly dire, crew might be forced to try their luck with the survivors of the Space Corps' inhumane experiments from their golden age. I mean, of course, the genetically engineered life forms that inhabit the dark corners of the galaxy. One example of these surviving Gelfs is the Kinawitawawi tribe. An outwardly primitive species, the Kinawitawawi are nevertheless skilled negotiators and traders. Uh, the Oxygeneration Uni. Looks like they're ready to fix a price. I thought we'd fixed a price with all the bangles and baubles we've given them. Uh, no, sir, that was just for the honor of entering their Watunga, or hut. The bartering proper begins now. <coughs> Oh dear. <laughs> what? What, you want my hat? My jacket? You want my jacket? Uh, no, sir, he doesn't want your jacket. He doesn't want me long johns, does he? <laughs> Not your long johns either, sir. Well, what then? <laughs> me? He wants me. Uh, yes, sir. He says in exchange for the oxygeneration unit, he wants you to be his daughter's mate. That's his daughter? <laughs> One of three. Apparently, sir, she's the looker. But while it is possible to have an experience with Kinawitawawi that doesn't end in the ruthless slaughter of the whole crew, running into other Gelfs can pose a more deadly and an immediate threat. Enter the sirens, devolved forms of life that resemble giant insects, but with the psychic ability to project an individual's ultimate desire to lure them into brain-sucking range. Kiss me. Oh, I can't resist you anymore, featuring to sister. Your death will be exquisite. I'll take you to the peak of ecstasy, and then I'll blow your mind. Whether these creatures are related to the much more friendly pleasure gulfs, it's likely their origin lies in a similar place. That of a Space Corps officer's bunk, where humanity's desire to reach the stars was equal only to their obsession for having their cake and eating it. It gets worse too, because the gulfs designed, made and discarded by the Space Corps aren't the only life forms that survived millions of years into the future. Enter the intelligent virus. An example of these cruel life forms is Epidine. Epidine was an intelligent organism designed to block all neural signals relating to nicotine craving. But in practice, it also blocked the signals telling the body it needed blood and oxygen. As an intelligent and sapient being, Epidine not only proved a fatal virus for its host, but also housed the keen survival instinct, taking over the dead body of its host and preserving itself by freezing itself in ice until the next hapless victim stumbles into its path. Oh God! God! Oh, are you all right, sir? I've just been molested by Tutankhamun's horny grandma. Of course I'm not smegging all right. These intelligent viruses are a deadly threat to those who make a habit of wandering onto ancient, abandoned spacecraft with little to no understanding of what they may find on board. There is no need for alarm, sir. If there were any dangerous viral strains in the atmosphere, the side scan would have picked them up by now. <laughs> Especially if they so happen to be salvaging vital components from said spacecraft, earning them the ire of the space drawer itself. Yes, even in the far-flung future, 
the Space Troll still survive, with Space Troll external enforcement vehicles patrolling the space lanes for those bold or stupid enough to break into galactic law. What? The space filth? A computer-controlled enforcement probe. It's scanning us now. It's frontier law, sir, and we're the deep space equivalent of horse rustlers. A severe sentencing is the only way to maintain order. Don't expect it to show us any mercy. What do we do? Let's face it, sir, we're as guilty as the man behind the grassy knoll. <laughs> yeah, but if we admit it, it'll blow us out of the stars. Recommendations? Well, suggest I take the rap for everyone, sir. You can say that I held you hostage and forced you at gunpoint to do my evil bidding. For God's sake, Crichton, we can't let you do that. Really? Dream on, metal trash. <laughs> Get your hands in the air and step into that searchlight. With the use of stasis technology, it's even possible for some humans to survive into the future, along with a range of artificial intelligences that continue to operate long past their expected runtime. Alas, most have been driven mad by loneliness over the years, or are otherwise possessed by some evil electronic disease. Why do we never meet anyone nice? Why do we never meet anyone who can shoot straight? But it's always worth holding out hope. There are, after all, some advantages to meeting a bona fide genius out there. In all our travels, we've met precisely 31 individuals 3-1, and we've never felt moved to invite a single one to join our crew. True, most of them wanted in some way to suck out our brains. <laughs> or erase us from history altogether. <laughs> Nevertheless, they still weren't what we would consider the right stuff. <laughs> we feel that you are different. We feel that you, like us, have the courage and the dignity it takes to make it as a dwarfer. Mr. Rimmer, I am moved by the eloquence of your invitation, but it is quite impossible for me to leave the confines of the Institute. It was Lister, wasn't it? He put you off. <laughs> Is there nothing we can do to change your mind? Absolutely. Then I'm afraid we must bid you farewell. We have a long journey ahead of us. Nonsense. You have no journey at all, my friends. I insist you stay here with me. You will be my honored guests from now until the day you die. Uh, 32. <laughs> I'm just going to come out and say it. Starbug is my favourite spaceship in science fiction. It's not that it's comfortable, it's definitely not that it's technologically advanced. No, it's a spaceship that you have to work at to keep running. Yes, it might not have the luxuries of its mothership, the small rouge one itself, but it does still provide a space to hang out with your mates, sit back, enjoy a terrible movie, and knock back a couple of lagers while drifting through space in search of the next adventure. They've taken Mr. Rimmer. Sure, they've taken Mr. Rimmer. Quick, let's get out of here before they bring him back. <laughs> and yes, it's true, not everyone or thing you come across is gonna want to be your best friend, but who needs more friends anyway? They despise humans and all forms of humanoid life. They believe you to be the vermin of the universe, sir. I didn't even know they'd met him. Admittedly, there could be a bit of nostalgia talking here. I mean, what are the perks of living on board Starbucks? It certainly isn't the recycled urine water. It's not the space weevil infested supplies, nor the hot water pipes spagulurgling into the night. No, I think the real joy with life aboard Starbug is, well, freedom. On Red Dwarf, you're free to lounge around in safety, knowing where the next meal is coming. On Starbug, you don't have that luxury, but you do have the drive and the excitement of finding that next meal. Be it from a simulant's torture supply cupboard or a skeleton's jewel. To survive, you're gonna need to think fast, play dumb, and do whatever's necessary to live one more day. If you're looking for a space adventure, this really is the best possible ship to have one. Just so long as you don't mind a noisy sewage pipe running past your bunk or the odd insectoid vermin for dinner. How's supper, Listy? It's delicious. Didn't have any crunchy king prawn left. Thank you for making your way to the end of the video, and to the end of our journey down the Red Dwarf rabbit hole. More regular videos should be coming soon, so do shout if you have any specific requests for spacefaring fun. Otherwise, hit subscribe, and I'll see you next time.